Right now, another winter storm is wreaking havoc in parts of the Northeast after sweeping across much of the Midwest, and it's likely that thousands of Americans will be left without electricity after the snow and winds blow through. Last week's winter storm that barreled up the East Coast wiped out electricity for more than 625,000 homes, according to the most recent estimates. Our nation's aging infrastructure is partially to blame for the high number of powder, power outages this time of year, but so are global warming and global climate change. And as climate change continues to rear its ugly head, we're going to see more and more storms that will wipe out power for more and more Americans. So to adapt to this climate crisis, shouldn't we be decentralizing power and energy in America and be giving communities and even neighborhoods the ability to generate their own power and thus be more resilient? Joining me now for more on that is John Farrell, Director of Democratic Energy at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. John, welcome. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for joining us. Could you first define what energy decentralization means and how is that different from the centralized systems that are prevalent today? You know, for 100 years we've had power systems that have been centralized. The power plant is out in a remote location and the power travels from there to our homes and businesses. And the idea of decentralization is basically to spread it out, to generate power closer to where we use it from all the sorts of different sources. I mean, a great corollary, frankly, is the internet, uh, decentralizing our computing power and letting everybody have a piece of the pie. Are there regions of the world, countries, localities that are already decentralized? You know, I would say there are areas that are already decentralizing. Uh, Germany and Denmark, for example, have done a tremendous uh, amount in order to transition both to renewable energy resources but also to transition the control of those resources from the hands of utilities and the traditional controllers into the people like cooperatives farmers individuals now providing their own energy how does decentralization fit into a broader strategy to keep carbon in the ground well frankly decentralization is a way to put communities in charge of their own energy future and when communities are making decisions for themselves they're not going to pick to build a dirty coal plant to build uh, even a natural gas fired power plant they're going to pick uh, renewable energy resources to power their community because it's not only a source of energy it's a source of power and control over their energy future and it's a source of economic development for the community and so i see energy decentralization is really the key to uh, addressing climate change in a way that communities will really buy into. But there's a, a fundamental paradigm shift here. I mean, uh, companies that right now by, might be running nukes or coal-fired fire, power plants or whatever could, in many places and in many cases, simply build a giant wind farm or build one of these giant, you know, heat the molten sodium solar plant, plants and still be centralized, still have all the customers having to get 100% of their electricity from them rather than, for example, putting um, uh, you know, PV panels on the roofs of every house. Uh, isn't that really the issue of shifting the paradigm rather than shifting the, the source? Or is it both? It's, you know, I would say it's both. And what's happened is that the, the, the paradigm shift you mentioned is possible because of the technology shift, because wind and solar are inherently decentralized resources. When you have a huge wind farm, it's made up of hundreds of individual wind turbines, that each that enough to power, you know, 500 to 1,000 homes. When you have a huge solar array out in the desert, uh, they're building them out of the same PV panels that you put on residential rooftops, commercial businesses, you know, the roof of your IKEA store. And so we have this opportunity made possible by the technology. But you're right, unless we have the rules uh, set up in such a way to allow for broad participation, broad ownership, we may not see that paradigm shift uh, in the control of the energy system. Is it cost or is it political will that's the biggest challenge here to that paradigm shift? It's definitely a question of political will because what we found uh, you know, in debates that have just taken place in Minnesota and California and Colorado and other states across the United States is that there, there's a real cost advantage to utilities to letting people generate their own energy. You know, when I put solar on my rooftop, it not only powers my home, but if I'm not home and using energy, it powers my neighbor's homes. It can save the utility money on infrastructure, money on delivering energy during peak times. Uh, the issue really is one of control over that energy system and one about market share for the utilities. And frankly, they're reluctant to give up uh, what's essentially been a 100-year monopoly over uh, both control of the system and control of the economic resources. Very often the argument is framed in the terms of either one giant monopoly, highly centralized system, versus, or every single home is an independent power station, essentially. What about a, an intermediate uh, step you know every city block is its own power station uh, or every neighborhood or community is its own you know has its own 
internal uh, grid that will stabilize and balance loads and things for people within that uh, area? And is that sort of thing being done you're, anywhere? You're definitely seeing that kind of development, especially after uh, Hurricane Sandy on the Northeast and other large-scale uh, climate-related disasters where communities are saying, you know, we, we can't get reliable energy from our utility companies. It's that, you know, they're very centralized when the lines are cut. Um, it's long distances for them to come and, and to do those repairs and the power sources are far away. So they're doing what are called microgrids, which is exactly what it sounds like. People creating sort of miniaturized versions of the electricity system. They're doing it on college campuses like University of California, San Diego, and they're doing it in places along the Northeast. Uh, you know, creating uh, housing developments, creating uh, commercial districts that will ha essentially have their own backup power, have their own power sources like solar to allow them to operate when the larger grid goes down. That's, that's remarkable. In the uh, half a minute we have left, thoughts on how this might apply to things like food and waste? Well, I think the, decentraliz the decentralizing principle really uh, is uh, very, is the key to all of these solutions. Um, it, it, putting communities in control of their own future, whether or not that's energy, food, or waste, uh, is, is really the answer. Um, I mean, waste, we go from uh, shipping out waste to landfills to having communities look at waste as a resource that they can use for re recycling and economic development. The same can be true with local food, and the same is definitely true with, with energy, both in terms of the economics and the technology. John Farrell, brilliant. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. It was a pleasure. Thanks so much.